Have your product development goals ever been hampered because the dimensions and tolerances were not effectively communicated on your 2D drawings? If so, you can avoid wasting time and effort and get your parts ready for manufacturing fast by using these five quick steps to improve your GD&T for product design. And stick around for the bonus tip at the end. Hello again and welcome. I'm Gordon Styles of Star Rapid, proud to launch season two of our Serious Engineering for Serious Engineers. Engineering. Today we're going to help product developers use GD&T more effectively. GD&T, or Geometric Dimensioning and Tolerancing, is a logical system of numbers, symbols and conventions applied to 2D drawings, either electronically or in blueprints. This information specifies the size, location, form and tolerance for every important feature of a part. For this reason, it's essential that GD&T is used correctly to avoid problems between the designer and the manufacturer. What kinds of problems? Well, it's a poor design drawing if, one, the dimensions of a feature are not specified, two, contradictory information is given, three, tolerances are too tight for the process, four, features can't be measured accurately, and five, features just can't be made at all. These are just a few examples of what can go wrong and you know who you are. Resolving these types of issues takes a lot of back and forth between the designer and the manufacturer. Since that time is better spent on making great parts, we want to share these five simple steps that can make the process faster and easier. Step number one, indicate which GD&T system you are using. The most common ones are ISO 1101, ISO 8015 and ASME 14.5. And I want to make the point that no system is better than any other. They're just different. And that's why you must tell us which one you're working to. In addition, specify the revision of the standard. When a new revision comes along, some of the definitions, symbols or nomenclature may change. A manufacturer cannot make the part correctly if they don't know which system and which revision you are working to. Step number two, specify your data. data is the plural for datum. A datum can be any axis plane or point that you nominate. Which datum would you choose? Well, that depends on your design intent and the application. For example, if your part is going to eventually connect to or interact with another part in a future assembly, the place where they meet or join is a great place to have a datum. This ensures that at least those places are perfectly positioned. If you're wondering why an engineer like me would use the word perfect, which is not normally an engineering word, think about this. If a certain axis plane or point is the datum, everything else is measured from there, and therefore by its very nature, it is the zero point and therefore perfect. In addition, we have a few other important points we need to make clear about data. First, most drawings have a datum A, B, and C. These three are usually enough to specify all the reference points that are needed both for fabrication and for measurement. But which is the primary one? Well, that depends. If a datum is used to refer to a geometric symbol on the drawing, then this will be noted in the appropriate field or the feature control frame or FCF. If there are two or more data, then the first one listed takes precedence. The second one listed is the secondary and so on. The first one listed in the FCF could be either datum A, B or C in any order for that geometric feature. And there is no one datum that always applies to the entire drawing. Second, not every geometric symbol on the drawing needs to be in relation to a datum. Some examples of these that don't need it would be surface profiles, flatness, straightness and circularity. Third, three data are usually enough for any drawing. If you have the right three, then this is a good sign that you're using GD&T correctly. There's really only one situation where you need more than that. Imagine you have a long component that is symmetrical, like a truck axle. On one end of this part, you might have a group of geometric features and they need to be fixed in reference to each other. Therefore, you need data A, B and C to do that. Then on the other end of the part is another group and they need to be similarly related to one another. You might have data D, E and F for this purpose. These two groups can be measured independently and won't interfere with each other as long as they are linked by a simple reference line or point that joins them. This helps the manufacturer to make the features of the first group without worrying about the dispensation of the features of the second group, a much easier proposition. 
almost all components that I have personally ever worked on really only needed two or three data. So please, please, please try not to chuck alphabet spaghetti at drawings that don't need it, okay? Step number three, control the degrees of freedom. This is very important to think about when you prepare your drawings as it directly affects how or even if your part can be made. Consider for a moment a part floating in 3D space. On a Cartesian plane, an object has six degrees of freedom. It can move forward and back on each of the X, Y and Z axes and it can rotate about any of these three as I, J and K angles of rotation. Data, therefore, are essential not only for providing a reference point for measurement, but also for controlling those degrees of freedom. That's why we consider these two concepts to be linked. It works like this. The first datum, let's call it A, locks as many degrees of freedom to that point as possible, at least three and preferably four. Then datum B locks another one or two, and these should be different to those in datum A. Why is that? Well, for the sake of clarity and expediency, if data A already defines the limits of motion on three axes, then why bother using data B to tell the manufacturer what they already know from data A? It leads to confusion, and it misses the point, because the purpose of B is to limit the degrees of freedom that A has not already locked. If there is some confusion, refer to what we said earlier about which datum takes precedence in a feature control frame. When all six degrees are locked, then it's clear where every feature should be in three-dimensional space. Step number four, use parametric design software. As we mentioned earlier, 2D design drawings are used to record all of the numerical information for a part, but it's the 3D CAD model of that design which is actually used for digital manufacturing. It's essential, therefore, that any changes made to the 2D drawing are accurately reflected in the 3D model. Using the parametric constraints built into the intelligent software, geometric dimensions on a 2D drawing are automatically linked to the 3D model, which is adjusted parametrically. Luckily, most modern CAD programs such as Fusion or SolidWorks support parametric modeling, and these systems usually will not allow you to create contradictory GD&T. And if you really must do your GD&T outside of your 3D CAD system, then you can always use a piece of software like Kotem Evolve Design that leads you through the creation of your GD&T step by step and will not allow you to add anything that contradicts another part of the drawing. Step number five, limit the CTQ or critical to quality dimensions. In our experience, 10 is more than enough for even the most complicated part. This is because too many tight tolerances adversely affect what's called tolerance stack up or layering of risk. For a manufacturer, in practice, a single tightly tolerance critical dimension guarantees that a certain percentage of parts will be scrapped trying to achieve this tolerance. Each additional critical dimension then increases this scrap rate exponentially. Even if the scrap rate per CTQ is just 1%, if you have 30 CTQs, that's a scrap rate of 35%. If it's 2%, then your scrap rate would be 81%. So, be sure to minimize your number of CTQs, otherwise you, you might start to wonder why manufacturers like me don't want to work with you, or they start doubling their prices. That's why we recommend specifying as few CTQs as necessary. The remaining dimensions will otherwise be made in accordance with the manufacturer's general tolerance standards, such as, let's say, DIN ISO 2768 fine. In a modern CNC shop, using good equipment, that's more than achievable for most jobs. Bonus step, take a course in GD&T. Even experienced design engineers may not know how GD&T on a drawing affects manufacturability. Also, standards are constantly being updated to reflect the latest advances in material and manufacturing technology, so it's always a good idea to keep up to date. At the bottom, we've shared some links to a few good online resources that you can check out. So to recap, today you've learned about the importance of specifying what GD&T standard and revision you're using, the importance of locking degrees of freedom, using parametric software, and limiting the number of critical dimensions. Use these steps and you'll be well on your way to speeding up your product development process. That's all we have time for today and because this was a serious and highly technical subject, you'll notice that we made no jokes or puns, just stuck to the facts. And we're not gonna make a joke, so don't even ask. Seriously, I mean it, don't ask. What? One. They said I can tell one joke. That's very kind of you, thank you.
To an optimist, the glass is half full. To a pessimist, the glass is half empty. To an engineer, like me, the glass is twice as big as it needs to be. And if you laughed even a little bit, please be kind enough to ding the bell, like us and subscribe, and we'll see you next time with another episode of Serious Engineering. Serious Engineering.